You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Hi, Frank Moore for Life on Gabriola TV. In 2019, the Islands Trust, which as Gabriolans will know, but some others watching this video may not, has a mandate to preserve and protect the islands and waters in our area, issued a climate change emergency declaration in which it committed to climate action in the trust area. At the most recent local trust committee meeting, Gabriola resident and former trustee Deborah Ferens presented a letter to the trustees regarding the upcoming review of Gabriola's official community plan and land use bylaw. In it, she expressed concern that a staff report about the upcoming review did not mention the climate emergency. As you'll see in Ferens' view, it should be taken into account in every aspect of the review. In this video, we bring you Farron's presentation to the LTC, including her letter, and then Teresa O'Leary follows up with an interview with Deborah. Here it is. Thank you. Um, Deborah Farron's, I'm from uh, I live on the Gabriel Island, and uh, happy September to you all, and welcome. Yeah. Um, this is a, a really brief, and I did send this off, but I was very late in sending this off to the trustees. Uh, it's uh, it's concerning the staff report on the OCP review of July 20th, 2023. So I am appreciative of the solid work of the staff report and thankful for highlighting the importance of personal agent consultation and engagement in the community process with the intent of um, and commitment to identifying and including First Nations priorities in the OCP and LUB. But I am sad uh, that nowhere in the report, in this particular report, is the climate emergency mentioned or included. I do trust that throughout the community engagement process and in subsequent messaging and information sharing, that the climate emergency will get due attention but I feel that it should be emphasized in every part of the OCP and LUB review project from every staff report to the project charter language to all communication and the engagement process and ultimately in final bylaw language. The climate emergency declaration is not just a throwaway statement or a nod to the issue unrelated to the detailed work of regulations, bylaw amendments and zoning considerations it is absolutely essential and fundamental to every part of community planning in our times. Sometimes I worry that the climate emergency just becomes one box among several others to check off while focusing on a specific review interest. The question that I would ask is what would housing, development, water sustainability, DPA, zoning, sort of take your pick, look like given the scope and scale of the climate emergency? The LTC um, could signal a commitment to the arc of climate justice and the rights of nature if there were a climate emergency APC, Advisory Planning Commission, in active operation during this OCP and LUV review project through all the phases. And I just wanted to add one more uh, comment that wasn't in my um, brief letter, which is um, for this past year, Sustainable Gabriel has been doing 12, 12, 12 climate um, cafes, and they really have been very informative, very dedicated um, uh, community members that are showing up for different topics every month, and, and all the topics have some relevance to the OCP, and, and they will be writing a report that might be of some interest to the LTC as they um, consider climate the climate emergency in the in the work of the OCP. So thank you very much. Hi Deborah, thanks for joining us. Hi Teresa, and thank you for asking me. So you went to the recent Gabriola Local Trust Committee meeting in September and you had a letter that you'd written and you read it to the local trustees directly. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was the main message or point in your letter? Well, the climate emergency is the main point of the letter, and that's connected specifically to 
this, the upcoming very significant, very important um, official community plan review project. And so uh, as a random citizen, Deborah, I am very concerned about uh, climate change and the climate emergency. And um, I felt that I would like to have um, added that note to the um, discussions that were happening. Right. And from what I heard when I listened to the meeting, it sounded like you were asking them to use this declaration of climate emergency that happened in 2019 and sort of use that as the lens through which they'll see everything and plan everything. Is, is that accurate? That's accurate. That's very good analysis. Could you tell me more about that? I mean, how would that, what would that look like for mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a, a climate emergency declaration, and as you said, uh, in from 2019, and it isn't as if climate change hasn't been part of the uh, Islands Trust and the local trust committees on their agenda and on their radar for a long time. It's been there. The declaration itself, it was a significant um, um, event and movement and and commitment and so having that declaration means something it is it, it isn't just um, words that you just sort of check off and say okay we've done that let's move on it, it, it is significant and it will affect everything that we do <clears throat> and so it feels like it's it's declared, but it also needs to be part of the wording of the official community plan, part of the ongoing discussions, part of the development, part of the community uh, engagement. That it's always kind of up there, front and center, and that doesn't mean that all the other issues won't have lots of attention uh, as they should. And the climate emergency will inform a lot of the language and the way the project proceeds. Right. Take me back to 2019, if you could. You were paying attention at the time when the Trust adopted the Declaration of Climate Emergency. Mm -hmm at that time. Um, what was driving that uh, movement to create that at that time? Well, there was a few things. Uh, so, so one, it was uh, former Gabriola uh, trustee Scott Colborn and another trustee from another island that brought it forward. So, you know, thanks to um, uh, former trustee Colborn for, for, for focusing on this. The climate emergency and declaring one um, was um, happening uh, around other municipalities and other communities um, in Canada. And um, so it was already out there right. and other cities, other communities, uh, municipalities were adopting it. Like Vancouver so, did it, I that's think, right. too, right? Yeah. That's right. So it was already getting some momentum happening um, in the area, in the regions, and so it's, it's part of that movement. And I have a feeling, though, that even without that, that probably would have been coming anyways locally at the Islands Trust level, just because of the um, high sense of awareness that the islands have for climate change and the climate emergency and how it's affecting our um, are the islands? Yes. Right. And did that declaration have any actions attached to it at the time or since then? I mean, I guess my question is, it's been four years mm -hmm. since that declaration. Mm -hmm. What's your sense about how Islands Trust is doing on that front? Well, I think they will say, and I will agree. I do agree with them that they're. It's always part of their um, background work for sure, and, and it's there. And I think that th th by declaring the um, climate emergency, they were also committing to intensifying their efforts to uh, match the urgency of the climate change emergency 
with um, with policy work, with developing toolkits, with um, at meetings when the subject comes up and how you talk about it in the community. So I think they were already committing to to how do we use this in action? How will we use this in tools? And of, of course, these things to use it in bylaw language or to use it in uh, in actual uh, development of, of procedures. They, they have those have to come up and be front and center and then you put the climate emergency behind it and say okay then how do we proceed on with this knowing that we've committed to looking at the climate emergency right right going forward do you have any specific ideas about what the trust should be doing in terms of that declaration um, well I think there's one thing at the trust area level, at the federation level, which is um, in the trust policy statement, which was being um, uh, reviewed uh, a, a couple of years ago, and it's just in a, a holding pattern right now, it, it was already uh, being included in the language as a very high level statement. And so that, that at the trust level that's happening, and then I think we have an opportunity at the local trust committee level to include the climate emergency language and references in our official community plan. And that's right now a focus for the, the trust committee, right? It is. is to this, it's a 2050 <clears throat> official community plan, is that right? Well, um, it's the official community plan is, is being opened up for review. And so it's, a, it's an official community plan review project and the official community plan has not been uh, reviewed since 1996-97, so that's a long time. And it, there was a targeted review in 2008 to 2011, but, that, but that's different than a whole full review. So I think the 2050 part is just the idea of what's the vision of, of 2050, but once this work is undertaken and proceeds over the next two or three years, and it could even take longer, but for sure that length of time. Once the community has had its input, there will be changes to the official community plan, and it has to go through all its legislative process to be finalized. I see, okay. Now you wrote this letter. That takes a lot of focus and time. Why were you so driven to write the letter, and then also, to go into the meeting and directly speak it to the trustees. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Well, for first of all, climate, the climate emergency is probably the main area of activism that I focus on. So wherever I go or wh whatever kinds of meetings I attend, that's always for me a piece of uh, information or a piece of uh, um, a lens through which to look at things and I also try to attend no I don't go to every local trust committee meeting but I try to attend as many as I can because I'm interested in the local community planning part of it and so uh, when the staff report came out that was the first staff report on okay we're gonna start how are we gonna do this I just noticed that the climate emergency was not specifically included in the language in the staff report. And I just thought, well, I would like to draw attention to that. Right, right. It takes a lot of effort to do that still and all. Mm -hmm. So how did it go over when you went to the uh, meeting? You're a former trustee mm -hmm. going in and calling, you know, the, the current trustees to account mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, how does that feel for you when you go into that situation? Well, I think because this was presented as part of the town hall, so anyone can get up. There's always a section in uh, the local trust committee meetings where uh, citizens and community residents can show up and speak to anything that's on the agenda. And, and people do, so every town hall has several people that stand up and speak to different items on the agenda. 
And that's an opportunity for the public to share a concern or share a supportive statement or draw attention to something. So um, this was really just, uh, no, I will, I'll take that back, not just. <laughs> uh, this was an opportunity for me to attend a meeting and in the town hall section of the meeting to get up and just share this letter about the climate emergency statement. Right, right. And you yourself were a trustee in the past. Tell me about that experience. Yes, I was an elected trustee for the 2008 to 2011 um, term and um, it's very intense, very interesting. Um, it's very public <laughs> and um, there's always lots to learn. And I was, I'm happy that I did it. I'm, I'm glad that I had that opportunity uh, to both, you know, serve the community and also have some input into um, some of the ideas that were um, emerging at that time too. Right, right. Looking at the situation now, I mean, that's 12 years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you've been observing um, how Islands Trust has been doing their job since then. Um, I mean, it's going to be 50 years next year mm -hmm. for Islands Trust. Do you think it's doing its job in protecting Gabriola Island and the Gulf Islands? I think all our trustees work really hard, and I know how much the effort they put into everything, um, the background work, the meeting residents and going to meetings and being public, having their meetings in public, their deliberations uh, in in that manner, um, I think that I think that they're doing a good job. Yes, I do. I don't always agree with them, and um, and sometimes I wish there was you know other ways to advance certain kinds of planning tools, but uh, I, generally I think they're 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 doing a good job. Yeah, it's a hard job. Right. And going forward, do you think Islands Trust has the tool, tools to continue to protect these islands? There, yes, there are tools, and the mandate itself are, are very strong. So you feel, you feel comfortable with where things are in, that, in those terms. How about this recent summer? We've had an incredible summer of wildfires. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were worried about it, of course, and mm -hmm. we're still not out of the woods completely in Canada. Um, you know, what have, what's been on your mind through this summer in terms of your environmental concerns? Well, I would certainly come back to the uh, climate emergency because the, 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 that is what is happening with the, the increase in, in fires and the droughts that we're having and the atmospheric rivers. So I think that both the declaration, the evidence that's in front of us um, is going to be compelling throughout this whole process of uh, looking at the official community plan and the land use bylaws. I do believe that they will have a strong um, um, presence in, in, in the discussions that will, that will ensue in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts about where we are right now in terms of this climate emergency? Well, I certainly think that to be really specific to our official community plan, right now in our community context, in our upfront goals, community goals, I mean, the only reference right now is Coastal areas are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, so that's been recognized. Um, there's the whole, in, in 2008, 2011, and even before that, there was already like a high recognition in the, in the Islands Wide Trust to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and prepare for the impacts of climate change. And so I think since then, the update to our official community plan really does have to put some high-level statements about the climate emergency and refer to it and then answer the question or that the community I think will be very involved in is how do you become a climate uh, a, a climate resilient community 
Like, what does that mean? So what are the kind, I, we know the signs, we know the different things that can be done. We, we have tools that we can improve, advance, introduce new tools, and, and at the same time, always with that end question, how do we become a climate resilient community? So I think that, for me, if I can hear that evolving in this, uh, throughout this whole process, um, I know that will be uh, very comforting and important. And I think we live in a community that's very aware of this and, and it's going to arise and people are going to want to talk to this. And, and there's so much expertise and information and uh, knowledge out there and activism around the climate um, uh, the emergency that that we'll hear a lot. Okay, well thank you so much for coming in today. Well thank you for having me Teresa.